so people are starting to come in now. Okay. Your video is working. Yes, it works at first, and then when the sound goes bad, we turn it off. No, okay. So I start with the video <coughs> each time. And then it just depends, I think, how many people are, um, are on stream yeah. doing the school stream much yesterday and today. It's already Here breaking up now. Yeah. 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 So we go back to, we go back, yeah, to, okay. we've gone back to no picture. But, and then it should sound fine. Yeah. What you want is one of those free computers from the government, then you'd be all right. <laughs> Hello, everybody who is filing in. I can see lots and lots of you. I'm just waiting a little bit till it goes up. Um, we're keeping my camera off because it makes the sound worse, um, but we're here really, fear not. We have a lot of people coming to this session. Fantastic. Great. So I think we have lots of people in now. So I will make a start. So this is our final keynote. I've been looking forward to this called Leading and Misleading in the Age of Uncertainty. We are very lucky to have Keith Grint, who is Professor Emeritus at Warwick University. And as well as working across industry and in academia, Keith is the author of lots of different books, including Fuzzy Management and the Arts of Leadership, and many other books on leadership. And I like the sound of his new one, which is coming out this year, which is called Mutiny and Leadership. I'm intrigued by that. Um, you all know how this works now. Do put questions in the Q&A and I will um, give some of those to, uh, to Keith at the end. But let me hand over to Keith for his keynote, Leading and Misleading in the Age of Uncertainty. Welcome. Thank you very much, Claudia. And uh, good evening, everybody. Um, just, um, just a quick response to the introduction. I don't normally like introductions. I think I'm allergic to them. A few years ago, I was doing a talk for University College Hospital London. And whoever was introducing me said, welcome to cohort three of the program. Uh, we've been using Keith's work for cohort one and two, but we didn't get him to speak to cohort one or two <laughs> just because we thought he was dead. Uh, oh. He appears not to be dead. You're on. So I responded with my favorite line from an American funeral parlor and the strap line to the funeral parlor is, you die and we do all the rest. Right, and on that happy note, we'll crack on. So leading and misleading in the age of uncertainty. Um, so this is what the age of uncertainty looks like. Um, we have a kind of VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. It's a wash with wicked problems. Most of my recent work has been about wicked problems. We're currently stung by COVID. We have the highest uh, death rate today, actually. Uh, we have Brexit to uh, worry about. I know fishing is all stuck somewhere. Uh, we have economic problems. We have Trump. Uh, we have environmental problems, um, so never have so many faced such an uncertain future for so long a time. So self-evidently, uh, what we need to be able to resolve all these things and help us from this impending doing our heroic leaders. Oh, don't know how that got on. Um, anyway, uh, let's go beyond the heroic leaders. Let's just think about um, the old times, the old days where things were much easier. So if we're living in a world which is totally unpredictable, presumably, there was a time when everything was totally predictable. Um, we didn't need leadership because leadership is really about uncertainty. What we wanted was management. And what we really wanted, therefore, was this man. We needed Fred, Frederick Taylor. Yeah, he was the person who was going to be able to save us. So Frederick Taylor, of course, was interested in management as a science, the application of science to achieve the one best solution. And there's always just one best solution for uh, Taylor. This is how science works. Uh, according to him. So really this is a place where efficiency and best practice and tick lists operated. So if the thing that you're looking at at the moment has got this best practice and tick list involved and it's about efficiency, uh, that's problem a world, probably a world where F. W. Taylor would be able to, to help you. Uh, this is one of those worlds, this is, um, uh, <clears throat> this is a scheme from a few years ago, this is from my wife's a primary school teacher or was 
And uh, this is a assessment scheme from a few years ago, in which her classroom was divided into uh, seven cozy corners and each cozy corner was associated with a tick list of about 35 items. So as soon as you get a tick list, you know you're in the world of management. And her job was to um, work out what each and every one of these 28 children had explored and managed to succeed in one or all of these 35 things. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. If we go right to the middle of this, uh, PSED, the first PSED, this was, so did the children experience play and learning in a range of indoor and outdoor environments which stimulate wonder, imagination, excitement, and the disposition to learn tick? And the one above that, did they make marks with a range of tools, uh, preferably not on somebody else's head tick? Uh, so I, I think luckily, um, that one didn't last very long. And we know that um, by and large, the restructuring of organization and the change in organization that certainly occurs in the education world means that this kind of tick list approach doesn't last very long, but don't worry, there'll be a new tick list along. Now, one way of capturing what we're doing across time, whether in fact we are operating in a land of total uncertainty, and it's never been like this before, is to kind of map it out, to map out the management or the leadership systems or approaches across time. This particular graph, you've got on the, on the vertical axis, you've got a timeline and on the horizontal axis, you have increasing levels of rationality. Uh, so you can start at the very bottom. You've got um, Carlyle, of course, who was interested in great men. There, were, there weren't any great women in Carlyle's time. They were just great men. And the rule of thumb, which is basically that experience. And then across time, Taylor comes in and Fordism, and you get the rise of scientific management, which is, of course, is later than Carlyle and actually more rational than Carlyle. And then when they get to a particular point and kind of move to the end of their rationality, their logic, because then you get to the kind of Hawthorne experiments and human relations, the 1930s and the 1940s and so on, up the scale, you go to the 1950s with contingency theory and systems analysis, then you get corporate culture from the 70s and 80s, 90s, you get new public management, you get competences, benchmarking, in the 2000s, you get distributed leadership, you get authentic leadership, and now we're into populist leadership. So in theory, this is one way of looking at what's happening across time. We're becoming more rational and we're getting more rational leadership uh, approaches across time because certainty is actually increasing rather than decreasing. That's one way of looking at it. There's a different way of looking at it. Um, this book in front of you is uh, Galbraith, The Age of Uncertainty, which is published in 1977, which tells you something about whether in fact we are living in the age of uncertainty or he was living in the age of uncertainty. So if you go down the list on the left-hand side to think about just how uncertain we are now compared to <clears throat> what we were before. So now we have COVID and you know, last year and before we had Brexit, which seems to be going on forever. Uh, then we had a global financial crisis in 2008. We had the Iraq war before that. We had 9-11, we had the first Gulf War, we had the fall of apartheid, we had the fall of the Berlin War, we had the Vietnam War, we had AIDS, we had the Chinese Revolution, we had World War II, we had the Holocaust, we had the Spanish Civil War, the rise of the Nazis, we had the Great Depression of 29, we had the Russian Revolution in 17, we had the First World War, the first automobile, the first fight, and that's just the 20th century. And I'm not gonna read out the list of the 19th century or beyond. What I'm trying to suggest here is that every, <clears throat> excuse me, every cohort, every generation seems to assume that they're living in an, in an age of total uncertainty and it, it never was this before. So something as unique, as unique is, is now happening and we have to live our world totally newly. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced this is the case. We certainly live in a world of uncertainty, but the world is probably always uncertain. That's the point. I'm not sure there ever was a world of certainty. No matter, no matter how hard you look for one, there doesn't seem to be one. And so maybe the model is not one of increasing rationality across time. Maybe there's a different way of thinking about this. So this is an, another example of the way of distributing these models. This is a binary model. Uh, it's drawn from linguistic structuralism, which basically argues that the way that we think is rooted in the way that our language works, which is rooted in binaries. So uh, you only know what day is by knowing what night is, you know what white is because you know what black is, it's that kind of approach. So there are these two extremes written into the language, which means that our thought processes are locked into these two um, alternatives. So what you have again, the timeline is on the uh, vertical axis, but instead of going 
horizontal, sorry, instead of going um, diagonally across and becoming more rational, uh, we start on the right hand side, which is the land of culture. And then we shift to the left hand side, which is the land of science. So we start with Carlyle, which is a kind of cultural argument. And then of course, Taylor is a scientific argument as is Ford. And then when we get to the extreme patterns of Taylorism and it can't do any more for us, then what, not, what happens is not even, even more scientific approach to leadership or management, but a shift back towards a cultural approach, which is represented by kind of Hawthorne the responses in human relations. <clears throat> and then when that fails to go any further, what we do is we end up shifting in the other direction back towards science. So we get systems theory, we get contingency theory. Then of course, we come back to the culture, we get corporate culture. Then of course, we go back to the science, uh, psychometrics, competences. And then we come across to where we are at the moment, which is distributed leadership, authentic and populist, which are all cultural arguments. They're not arguments rooted in science, they're arguments rooted in culture. That's the second way of thinking about now, how we think about change across time, whether we're in fact living in a very uncertain world or a world which is just shifting between these two binary positions of science and culture. So a third way of thinking about this is it's got nothing to do with any of that. It's actually to do with the context and particularly the political context. So in other words, the leadership management models that we operate with are rooted in political events rather than anything else. They're rooted in the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. So again, starting at the bottom, we get Carlyle's great man. This is the beginning of industrialization, uh, industrialization the kind of heroic age. And then you get um, global competition increases, the first world war breaks out. And this is really when scientific management comes to the fore. And if you think about the way that the, for example, the first world war is fought, it's fought on the principles of scientific management. You know, the, the movements across space are, are based upon this notion that everything will be in lines, it will done, be done by time, they will be moving artillery barrages, and everything will be scientific and perfect. And of course, none of it actually is. And then when that fails, and when the First World War finishes, and when Taylorism comes to um, a slight uh, halt in the road, <clears throat> what we get is the rise of the, the Great Depression, and that coincides with the rise of communism and fascism. In other words, it's, it's not coincidental that you get the rise of the Hawthorne approach and human relations at the same time as you get the rise of communism and fascism, because human relations is rooted in an argument that what we're looking at are irrational masses. Most people are irrational. The mass is irrational, but luckily the mass is led by charismatic individuals who are, and management that are totally rational. And of course, we get to the, uh, the end of the war, we get the domination of the US, and then you get the domination of materials that come out of the US. So contingency theory, systems analysis, self-actualization, you know, the work of Maslow and McGregor are all American based and they're all rooted in really in this kind of individualist approach. So the Americans in their argument won the war, that leads to an American approach to the way that we run management. Then we get the rise of globalization, the rise of Japan, you get a shift towards a different understanding of you know what what do we need to do and this is where the quote corporate culture and transformational leadership comes up <clears throat> and you get the rise of bush and blair new public management dpr and finally we get to the point where uh, you get notions of uh, the rise in terrorism uncertainty fundamentalism brexit covid <clears throat> and all of that feeds into an argument that the way to, to deal with these kinds of levels of uncertainty is probably populist leadership. So in other, in other words, what we're looking at historically is, is not um, a time now which is totally uncertain compared to the certainty that we had before. What we're looking at is just different forms of uncertainty. So if there never was an age of certainty or uncertainty, do we actually have to use all the three decision styles that um, I've certainly talked about and several others have talked about? So do we need to lead in the age of uncertainty, but we need to manage in the age of certainty and command in the age of crisis? Is that what's going on? So it's, it's less to do with the, the general uncertainty of the time and more to do with thinking about, so what is the appropriate decision mechanism uh, given the times that you think you are in? And what about misleading? So too often, um, and I've worked in leadership research for about 30 years, too often there is a very strong association between leadership and positive outcomes. <clears throat> this implies that if we're looking at leadership, 
we, we by definition have to be looking at something which is good. And the implication of that is that when we're looking at authentic leadership, for example, authentic leaders seem to be incapable of being unethical because one of the arguments of most authentic leadership approaches is that if we are authentic, then we are ethical. Now, I think these two people that are, that are in front of you, Stalin and Hitler, were both authentic. You know, they were true to themselves. They were both monsters, but they were true to themselves and they were both what many people would regard as highly unethical. And this over positivity uh, that we have, which kind of surrounds the leadership model, I think is nicely captured in David Collinson's work on Prozac leadership, which talks about an, an unremittingly positive approach from the top, which encourages leaders at the top to believe their own propaganda. So the only people that are talking on and actually believe that we're going to go for a moonshot with our vaccines or we are world beaters are the people that are talking about world beating systems. Now, it also discourages everybody else from raising problems, or admitting mistakes, <clears throat> which is why corporate leaders are always so surprised when things go wrong, given how well everything seems to be going. So, you know, why, if I'm the boss, why, why didn't you tell me stuff was going wrong? Well, the last time you told, someone told you, boss, that things were going wrong, you seem to remember, you disciplined them in public. And since then, nothing seems to have gone wrong. So here are some quotes from allied Western military leaders. Uh, these are quotes from leaders in Afghanistan. And I think these are interesting examples of what I think is Prozac military leadership. So 2004, General Bonner said, without question, 2004 will be a decisive year. Uh, General Abu Zaid, 2005 will be a decisive year. General Richards, 2006 will be the crunch year for the Taliban. General Shampoo, 2008 will be a decisive year. McChrystal, 2009, we're knee deep in the decisive year. Miliband, 2000, there's a lot of decisive years in here. Now, and I don't know if you follow um, what's happening in Afghanistan, but at the moment we have the highest civilian casualty rate ever. So whatever we've been looking at, it hasn't been a decisive year. So, so either I've completely misunderstood what's happening in Afghanistan, or what we're looking at are examples of Prozac military leadership, where the people at the top believe that we're on the brink of success yet again. And that's been going on now for nearly 17 years. Open the Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war said something similar. Their argument, or one of the arguments that Chilcot made is, is twofold. Uh, one is the UK military's inability to speak truth to power. This kind of runs into the Prozac stuff and that's compounded by a can-do attitude. Now, normally we think can-do attitudes are a really good idea, but actually in the context that we're looking at, when a, when a politician says to a military senior officer, can you do this? And the response is yes, of course, as opposed to, well, we can do this or we can do this, but we can't do both. Because that seldom happens, and we end up in places that we shouldn't be. Now, here's a piece of research I want you all to worry about. This is the conclusion, really. The more powerful you are, the more likely you are to make less accurate decisions. And that we would hope that people at the top are making more accurate decisions. But this is not about intelligence. This is about the sifting of information from below. So the people at the top don't actually know what is actually going on. So have we been misled from the very beginning? So Plato has an argument <clears throat> and he roots his argument about leadership in the so-called noble lie, which basically is an untruth or a myth, uh, often religiously based as far as uh, Plato is concerned. And this is perpetuated by the elite to maintain social harmony. Uh, Plato talks about it in terms of, you know, there are these three particular metals. There is gold for the leaders, for the philosophical kings. There is silver for the warriors and there's brass for the uh, the merchants. Uh, and this, of course, is a, a total fabrication. But uh, Plato argues that these kinds of fabrications, these kinds of noble lies are important to maintain social stability, especially when the alternative, as far as Nietzsche is concerned, is the so-called deadly truth that actually we would rather not face. I mean, it might be true, but I don't want to I don't want to know about it. This is I mean, one equivalent. And this is one that Plato talks about. It's about the ownership of land. So uh, most of us believe that you know, most of the land that we all occupy or own or rent is legitimately owned by somebody because this allows us to generate notions of transfer of ownership and it ensures social peace. 
But actually, if you look in the long run, now all the land that we now live on and we think has been legitimately bought from somebody has been at some point stolen from somebody. So the first people that lived in these lands, I mean, they got pushed out by the Celts and the Celts robbed the Celts and the Romans robbed the Celts and the Romano-British robbed the Romans and the Anglo-Saxons robbed them and the Norman French robbed them. So what, what we're looking at in terms of simple things like land ownership is that there really wasn't a time when it was so-called legitimately owned, except it was stolen. But, and this is the important point, if you leave that long enough, it looks like it's legitimate. And so this is one of the deadly truths that we would not rather not look at. The, 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 land, the land that we live on, we think is legitimately owned by us or somebody else, but actually even that is a bit dodgy. So Max Weber, the German sociologist, thought that actually that a shift in authority might be a way of saving us from misleadership. So uh, Weber distinguished between authority and power. So power for him is illegitimate or coercive and authority is legitimate. And he always talks about three different kinds of authority or legitimate power. He talks about traditional authority, so we comply with the monarchy as we used to because they were the monarchy and that was sufficient. Or there was charismatic authority. So for, for Weber, this is, a, this is a different way of understanding charisma from a conventional notion of somebody who is charismatic on television. That's not what he's talking about. What Weber is talking about is somebody of exceptional powers and a kind of superhuman, almost unique. And that combines with a social crisis or a moment of social distress, as Weber talks about. M moreover, this person, this charismatic, has a radical solution and they are usually prophesied, which is why all the examples that they be used as are basically religious. And then what this religious charismatic establishes is a, it's a devoted followership who believe in the individual's transcendent powers, but that has to be repeated for it to work. Now Weber's argument is <clears throat> across time, both of these two forms, traditional and charismatic, would probably be replaced by what he called rational legal authority or bureaucracy which was much more logical and much more rational than the two former modes. And he associated that with the rise of modernity or even the enlightenment. Uh, and for Weber, he associated all of that with so-called instrumental rationality. So the enlightenment and modernity is a kind of period of history, which is noted for the rise of science and uh, rational thought. And it's the displacement of traditional or, or religious thought or dogma, including the noble lies that we've just talked about. So instrumental rationality, as far as Weber is concerned, is a rational means to a given end. And this is really about efficiency, calculability, and predictability. This is the land of F.W. Taylor. It's exactly what Taylor was talking about. So the project of modernity was this rise of science and rationality and the removal of magic. There, there wouldn't be any magic anymore. And as far as Weber is concerned, there probably wouldn't be any religion because we would be able to explain everything. And what we're looking at, therefore, in the project of modernity is the rise of the age of certainty. So we should be heading to a more certain future, not a less certain future. But the problem, as far as Weber was concerned, is this, that the project of modernity, this notion of the growth of science and understanding and logic, was undermined by the process of modernization. So what you got when you got the rule of law, when you got an autonomous judiciary and a depoliticized bureaucracy, which is what Weber was talking about, <clears throat> is you, you would basically get the role, role of the expert at the expense of the patriots. So you can you know, eat your heart out, Gove. Um, we are always going to need experts. And it doesn't matter what you say. And we would also get, again, this is Weber talking, the technocrat at the expense of the idealist. So eat your heart out, Brexit, Bojo. Uh, you know, only an idealist would sacrifice economic well-being to sovereignty, so that's never going to happen. And Weber also talked about the rise of the bureaucratic leader, you know, the efficiently rational person at the expense of the charismatic. So we would never get Trump or Johnson or Bolsonaro, they'd have no chance of su succeeding. However, and this is the main point that Weber is trying to make, uh, <clears throat> Those that have eaten from the tree of knowledge, as he puts it, dispense to dispense with religion at the same time, they dispense with the associated common values. So this is the kind of dilemma that Weber is pointing out, that when you get this commonality, when you get the rise of logic and rationality, what you simultaneously undermine is the point of it all. Where, where are the common values that, that bind us together? Because as 
for Weber, those common values are rooted in some kind of irrationality, some kind of non-logical approach, non-logical value system. So the process of, of modernization is actually undermined by the project of modernity. Uh, and what he talked about is you would end up with, uh, and the image on the left-hand side, you would end up with a so-called iron cage of bureaucracy. We would be, we would feel ourselves completely constrained by bureaucracy, by a rule-based system. Um, and that we would, we would imitate something like this Nautilus. So the Nautilus on the right-hand side, this is an extraordinarily efficient mollusk, but it only floats in the ocean. It has no control over where it's going. And Weber's argument is that once we get to this, you know, completely rational form of society, but we have no control of our purpose behind what we're trying to do, then we have a problem. Uh, and this is made worse by the fact that the so-called iron cage isn't populated by rational liberal individuals. It is populated by people who are constantly at war with each other. So in an era devoid of values, and again, this is Weber, uh, by ironically, uh, the rise of the charismatic was more likely. So what you, and the most dangerous thing for Weber is this, when you get an extraordinarily efficient bureaucratic system because of the logic and rationality and the bureaucracy, that would be combined with a very unstable charismatic. And that's when, for him, you get big problems. So why doesn't democracy prevent this kind of charismatic misleadership? Well, one of the arguments of the Enlightenment is that as you get this critique of religious and royal sovereignty, I divine right of the elite, then sovereignty would lie with the people. And the consequence of that is that you'd get this control of the people, by the people, for the people, the kind of divine right of the people. But all sides claim this. You, know, you, know, you can see that how Trump talks about that in terms of draining the swamp, as though he's not part of the elite. And there are several problems that are locked into the notion of democracy that we need to worry about. The first one is the so-called folk theory of democracy. So this kind of populist model is, a, is based on the assumption that actually voters know what they're doing, the kind of wisdom of crowds uh, arguments. And because the, the majority uh, always know what they're doing and because of the wisdom of crowds, we're gonna get this progressive and civilized behavior. But actually we know from a lot of research into voters behavior that most of them aren't actually interested in politics. Uh, secondly, most of them don't understand policy details and they quite often vote against their own economic preferences. So voters do have strong preferences, but they're not really rooted in any kind of coherent ideological position. Uh, so most voters don't actually vote for ideological reasons, they vote for loyalty. That, that's why they vote, they vote on the basis of loyalty. And the second problem with the democracy argument is that actually <clears throat> the so-called retrospective theory of voting, sometimes called blind retrospection. So voters don't determine what their elected leaders do. They can't determine what they do, but they can vote them out on the basis of previous performance. So we know when things go wrong, we vote out bad leaders, as we've just seen. But this also implies that voters have got some understanding of the role of governments in significant events like global warming, crime, pandemics, the economy. But actually, we also know we don't. We know that voters quite often punish governments on the basis of really irrational responses like droughts or floods or pandemics. And this um, in, on the right hand side, what you see is a copy of uh, uh, a paper from Philadelphia in 1916 uh, when there was a, a large um, array of shark attacks. And this impinged upon Woodrow Wilson's votes as though for some reason the, the president is responsible for shark attacks. Locked into this is the so-called myop myopic retrospection. This, in other words, the past is relevant, but it's only the very recent past which is relevant to voters. They don't really care about the long term. What they care about is the short term. So Carter, the bottom right, he was punished in 1980 for the final year of his administration, which has good, which had problematic economics, but the previous three years have been good. And Reagan does the opposite. Reagan gets elected on the basis of a good final year, despite three previous bad years. So poor performance, and we know this from a lot of research, poor performance drives out good performance, especially if it's toward the end of an assessment period. Anyway, what makes us think that people are actually wholly rational? We've had 
you know, yeah, a century of research looking at the way that people are not actually as rational as they might claim or we might believe from uh, Todd's work in terms of uh, copying each other in terms of dress, Le Bon's work on groups as irrational, the Ash experiments, of course, an argument that uh, groups make very irrational decisions, uh, Teufel's work about uh, how people will, once they're assigned randomly to a group, then favor their own group over others. So <clears throat> there's all kinds of arguments that actually, even though we believe that people are rational and deep in our hearts, and certainly we are, and I am, obviously, we know this isn't the case. So there is an argument that effective democracy requires an appropriate balance between popular preferences and elite expertise. And we've got three members of, oh, I don't quite know what they are at the bottom. So D Durkheim, French sociologist, sociologist has a way of capturing this problem about how we view leadership. It, his argument, he, he talked to some students at one point and argues that followers have a sacred relationship to their leaders. They regard them as godlike in their ability to solve all our problems. So you don't need to worry because Boris Johnson's going to fix everything. So stop worrying about anything, it's gonna be fine. That's the first thing. The second thing is because None of our leaders actually are gods. When they fail, and they will fail because they're not gods, then we'll scapegoat them. And the consequence of the scapegoating activities, that means that none of us are ever responsible for everything at all. It's always the leader's fault. So I remember years and years ago, I had an MBA class and um, uh, it, the, these are the bottom four pictures I'm looking at now. Uh, England had just beaten Argentina in the World Cup. And the day afterwards, I had my MBA class and I said to the group, so what kind of leader do you think Sven Goran Eriksson is, who was at that time the manager of England? And the only English student in the MBA group said Sven was a god. And when God took England to the World Cup, not if, but when, then we would make him an honorary Englishman. That's how close he was to God. Well, that went down really well. I said, well, that's an interesting perspective. So we're playing Brazil next. What happens if we lose against Brazil? And the same student said, we will crucify him. And this is exactly what Durkheim would have predicted, that we treat our leaders as gods, and then we crucify them, then we scapegoat them. And both of those policies allows us followers to be irresponsible, non-responsible. So is leadership then the enemy of the people? This, of course, comes from um, Ibsen's work his play called The Enemy of the People. If you don't know the work, this is about a Norwegian uh, town which has invested lots of money in the new bath for the tourist season. Uh, and the, uh, the town's doctor, Dr. Stockman, uh, realizes on the day before the town is about to open its bath to the tourists, that the baths are actually being poisoned by the local town tannery. So he goes to his mayor, who happens to be his brother, and says, you have to delay the opening while we get rid of this poisoning. And the mayor says, I don't think so, not after this investment and uh, nobody will die, so stop being such a wuss. Uh, and Dr. Stockman says, well, if you won't take your responsibilities seriously, then I shall call a town meeting and persuade the people that they have a responsibility to protect tourists and we will close the baths. So he calls the town meeting. And the town meeting rails against him and calls him the enemy of the people. In other words, leadership here is talking about persuading people to face their own collective problems. This is both dangerous and extraordinarily unpopular. And it roots into the so-called Cassandra complex. So Cassandra, uh, the daughter of Priam, the Trojan king from ancient Greek uh, myths, uh, Apollo, the god, falls in love with the Cassandra and gives her the ability to foretell the future. But when she rejects his advances, he curses her, ensuring that although she retains the gift of prophecy, nobody will believe her. So this is the equivalent. So here is this woman who is telling you the truth but nobody believes her. So leadership is defined, therefore, as getting the collective to face up to complex collective responsibilities, and it's both unpopular and extraordinarily dangerous. And this is the opposite of Trump's and most populist leaders' approaches to this notion of enemy of the people. So this is, oh, that's got the wrong word, not enemy. Enemy of the people. So can we rely on the people to protect us from the enemies? After all, the people have spoken, right? So. This is how our media responded um, to the previous argument by our judiciary about whether Brexit and the response of the government was legal or not. 
uh, actually the phrase enemy of the people first came into the lexicon uh, via the French Revolution in 1789. It's used as a term of abuse against any opponent. And in 1794, there's a law um, set up by the Revolutionary Tribunal to punish enemies of the people. So all of these things that you see before yourself, um, establishing, re-establishing the monarchy, betraying the Republic, communication with the, all of that stuff, all of that makes you an enemy of the people. And for that, you will be executed. Uh, enemy of the people is also uh, used by um, both Lenin and Stalin in the Soviet Union. And it's actually Nikita Khrushchev who demands an end to the use of the term enemy of the people because it eliminates the possibility of any kind of ideological fight, i.e. it removes dissent. And then when you look at the way the enemy of the people is used, and of course, this is Jaws, which is, of course, framed um, from the play, framed from the enemy of the people. Uh, and what you have in Jaws is an argument that there is something eating people and you need to clear the beaches. Otherwise, lots of people are going to get eaten. Uh, and uh, there was a nice quote from Boris Johnson, and this is a few years ago, arguing that actually the real hero of Jaws was the Amity Mayor Larry Vaughan, because what Vaughan wanted to do is keep the beaches open under all circumstances, rather than close them and save people from getting eaten by Jaws. And this, of course, is exactly this. This is an argument about COVID, about whether you need to reopen the economy or whether you need to seek to save people. <clears throat> and what's quite interesting about the way that the leadership issue operates is how it can generate or propel a certain kind of concern to the front of the public mind. And so what this, this is an Ipsos Mori poll, and it's basically asking uh, the British population, uh, what are the most important issues facing you at the moment? And the pink line is concerns about immigration, and the blue line is concerns about uh, Europe. And if you look in 2016, and uh, until 2016, no one cares a hoot about Europe until David Cameron announces the referendum will be held. And at that point, everybody cares about the referendum. Everybody cares about the EU. And it begins to take over everyone's previous concerns about immigration. So this is really interesting about the notion of manipulation of agenda items, how you can, you can change the interests of people on the basis of things like this. So if we shift, what are we doing for time? If we shift from the mandate of the people uh, to the requirement of the situation, does that eliminate the problem of misleading? So if we just, if we just know what the situation is in a kind of contingency way, does that resolve the problem? So a contingency argument is, well, you tell me what the situation is, and then the logic of the situation will tell me what I have to do. So I want to use an example just to illustrate the problems of this. So here's the question: Do wars always lead to mass violence against civilians? So the contingency theory would suggest probably yes, because we know historically, as soon as we get some kind of war, we, we seem to get mass violence against civilians. So here's three examples of what happened. So uh, there were 20,000 women raped in Nanking in 1937. There were 100,000 raped in Berlin in 1945 and 50,000 raped in Bosnia in the Bosnian War, 92-95. So this seems to be an example where what happens is during civil wars, which are the most bestial of all, an equivalent, you get these horrendous things. This is what happens. But I want to think about Mitchell's work. Mitchell has a book called Agents of Atrocity, and he's looking at this question. What is the role of leaders in history, and particularly in civil wars, you know, the most, when the most bestial things happen to us? Is it, is it the case, the situation, the logic of the situation generates a horrendous response and horrible things happen, period? His argument is, no, that isn't the case. And he divides leaders into two kinds, Machiavellians and ideologues. For him, Machiavellians are only interested in power. So they will use violence to obtain and to retain power, but not otherwise. Whereas ideologues are only interested in dogma. And so their use of violence is about destroying the opposition. It doesn't matter whether they're a threat or not, they have to be destroyed. So when you put that into a graph, and you've got more use of violence on the vertical and more threats to power on the horizontal. So the, power, the, the, the diagonal line across the middle is the Machiavellian line. So the more I feel threatened by you, the more I'm going to use violence against you. But when the threat to me decreases, so does my use of violence against you. On the top line, the red line, the inquisitive ideologue line, 
Uh, they use violence irrespective of the threat to them. It's not about the threat. It's just about the removal of the enemy. Whereas in the yellow line at the bottom, the tolerator line, they never use violence, irrespective of the threat. Now, when you pop, whoops, it is, the population has gone. When you populate that uh, with uh, people, and I seem to remove the slide, we can talk about um, uh, Robespierre on the top line. So we know that there are more people being guillotined in the French Revolution, irrespective of the threats to the French state. So even when the French state is stabilizing, the French Jacobins are still executing hundreds of their enemies, not because they're a threat to the state, but because they're enemies. And then when we go to the tolerator line at the bottom, this is basically where Martin Luther King would sit. Martin Luther King and Gandhi never use violence, irrespective of the threats to them, even though, and this is ironic, their power base depends upon violence used against them. Oh, there's the pictures, that's what I'm looking for. So is there for leadership about disappointing people at a rate they can manage? This is one way of thinking about it. It's not about being heroic, it's about this. Was Ibsen right? So misleading is actually the easy option. Uh, leading is difficult, misleading is easy. The context, certain or uncertain, doesn't determine the response. Ultimately, we have to take responsibility for our decisions and this is the curse of freedom. Uh, and this is basically, whoops, let me get the right one. This is what uh, Sartre is talking about with his notion of bad faith. So Descartes was, I think, therefore I am. And Sartre was, I am nothing, therefore I'm free. So this freedom is vertiginous, it's anxiety inducing. There isn't a safety net. So any kind of passive response is bad faith as far, as far as Sartre is concerned. So we protect ourselves from reality by pretending that we don't have any choices. But of course, we always have choices. As long as we're prepared to put up with the consequences of saying no to somebody, they can't make us do anything. And that is the danger of the freedom. That is the curse of freedom. Okay, uh, that's me done. And it's um, almost half past. Don't we have uh, 10 minutes or so for any questions? So do we have any questions? Great, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. What a whistle-stop tour through so much, uh, diff so many different leadership theories there. Oh, here's a quick one based on what you've just said, actually. H how are you defining misleading? What, what does that mean? Well, that's a good question. So, so uh, misleading can be defined in all kinds of ways. One would be uh, not doing what you said you were going to do. That would be one way of misleading people. Uh, and another argument would be uh, misleading is actually to do with um, uh, contradicting some kind of general ethical position. And that in itself raises all kinds of arguments about, you know, what do we have a general ethical framework that we can all agree on? And I think the argument is probably not. I think there are, there are some extreme aspects of this that we might be able to agree on. You're not supposed to eat your grandmother. That would be something we could all agree on. But once we get beyond that kind of point, that the notion of an ethical agreement actually un is, is undermined by our um, historical patterns. So we know, for example, we know that there were, there were many thousands of Germans that supported Adolf Hitler uh, right towards the very end. Uh, and many of them would not agree that he was an unethical person. I mean, I think he was, and many people would think he was, but they, their argument is no, he's not unethical. He's doing what we think is right. So I don't think we ever get to, um, to a point where we can talk about uh, ethics in some kind of neutral position. So we know what ethical or unethical behavior is. We can argue that people are being misled if somebody, if a leader is saying something and then doing something different, that would be misleading, I think, in this context. Uh, can I get you to uh, stop sharing your slides so that we can see um, see the oh, whole yes. you? Yes, so that, that, me, that um, would that would be great. See if I can stop sharing my slides. Yeah, and then we get more of more of you. Uh, I think maybe you've done it. I think I probably have. Have yes. I done that? Yes, yes. I can see. Down. Yes, thank yes. you, thank you. That's great. Um, and uh, oh, here's a good question from Nancy. Where is leadership going in this uh, in the context of this age of misinformation? Hmm. Okay, well, well, the first thing is I don't, I don't think this is unique. I think we've always lived in ages of misinformation. I've just been spent um, the last year looking at um, uh, Roman patterns of misinformation. And, and then I've been more recently looking at notions of um, slave rebellions in Jamaica in the 1830s. 
and and we are always awash with misinformation. So I don't think it's I don't think it's novel. I think it might be more pervasive now because we have social media. But I don't, I don't think the idea of misinformation is is a particularly novel. What it's it, it often reminds me of um, Plato's argument about rhetoric. So Plato argument Plato argues that we shouldn't teach rhetoric to people because that will allow them to confuse people and to lie, to misinform them, to mislead them. Uh, and we should therefore stick to the truth and not allow rhetoric to be used. And Aristotle's argument is, sorry, Plato, but it's too late. The, 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 the tricks of, of rhetoric are already out in civilization. And therefore what we should be teaching is people to recognize the tricks of rhetoric so that they know when they're being misled. And I think that's the point, is actually to try to educate people to think about well, why would I believe this, as opposed to trying to remove everything. I don't think that's going to work. But I think you can educate people to the point where they become more critical of the information that comes to them and then ask themselves questions constantly. What, why, why is this allegedly true? Where's the evidence that what I'm looking at is true? Yeah, and that reminds me of the um, the game that uh, the psychologist Sander van der Linden has developed, where you 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 have a go at looking at you, you play at trying to get lots of followers on social media. Obviously, it's made up. You're not really doing it, and it shows yeah. you how, how the different ways so that you can then spot the different ways that people um, get that misinformation yeah. past people. Now, obviously, at the beginning, you were talking a lot about um, uncertainty and how there's always been uncertainty. Yeah. Would we get better leaders then if we stopped looking for some kind of certainty? I, I think this is a kind of mythical unicorn problem. There's, a, there's quite an interesting argument that when, when we're looking at how to resolve problems, for example, that, that the binaries, and I talked about binaries before, the, the binary that sits on our heads is often between a, a unicorn and a rhinoceros. So the unicorn is beautiful and it solves all our problems and we don't have to do anything about it because it just looks so great. And actually there aren't any unicorns. There are lots of rhinoceroses that just kind of trundle along and make mistakes and blunder into things and they learn from their mistakes. And that's, that's probably a more appropriate way of thinking about what leadership is and what problem solving might be. So, so the concern would be to, to recognize that there, is, there isn't any level of certainty and we should stop looking for these, these kinds of leaders which, which generate or project certainty that in itself is a problem. If they if they say to us, "Oh, I have the answer," and by the eleventh by eleven o'clock on the eleventh of March, everybody will have been vaccinated, for example, where is the evidence that that's ever been done before, and where is the evidence that we should believe that kind of person? So I think this, I think we need to be more critical, more cynical in some ways, of what our leaders are trying to do, which is not to undermine them, but just to say to take everything with a pinch of salt and recognise that. That the game they're playing is different from the game that we're playing. So do we vote for optimists um, because oh, I, we I, hope that they'll give us the thing we really want? Oh, do we? Yes, I think, yeah. I think very often we do. I think, you know, if you, are, if you are beset with two people and one says, you know, this is going to be pretty bad and, I'm, and worse, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> why would I vote for that person? I vote for somebody who says, I know exactly what I'm going to do and it's going to work. This is the, I mean, my football club is Blackpool Football Club, which is basically rubbish. But if, if I was picking a new manager and my question was, can you get Blackpool from the first division to the premiership in two seasons? And the person said, not a chance in hell, but I might be able to keep us in the first division. I would say, well, you're no good to me. Find me somebody who can take me to the very top because I want to believe that. But in my heart of hearts, this is not the right response. In your heart of hearts, you have to be able to think, well, what they're looking for is some kind of popularity poll. This is actually something, one of the reasons why Plato is so concerned with democracy is he thinks we'll end up with the people who are uh, the best looking and the most rhetorically skilled and the best liars. Mm. And that fits in actually, here's a question. How would you explain the Teflon nature of current leaders um, saying, you know, Ed Miliband lost uh, an election after there'd been a picture of him eating a sandwich and yet populist leaders seem to be able to, you know, do all sorts of things and get away with all sorts without being thrown out. Although one has been thrown out, of course. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is a, it's a really interesting issue about, um, about the requirement to get some level of media support for what you're about to do. Now, again, this is an argument about, listen, this is, this is really about compromising. So um, 
what well, one way of not compromising is to say well i'm not going to go in social media i'm going to tell the truth all the time and i'm i'm not going to uh, compromise on my ideals the consequence of that is you'll never get any power this is always the problem for political parties about do you need to compromise and say okay let's just go for level two rather than level 15 because we can probably get level two but we'll never get level 15 and and i think very often that's made more difficult if the media is already against you or if the media is already in support of you. So you can get away with all kinds of things if the media supports you that you couldn't get away. And you've, you've seen, I mean, you can see recently, the last few days, the media has started to turn against Trump and all, all, all of a sudden, everyone says, oh no, I always thought he was a crazy person. Whereas, you know, two years ago, um, a large group of people thought he was actually really good. So that there is something in here about the, the power and the influence of the media. And then underneath that is again, our recognition of this is what this is the game the media is playing. This is the game that politicians play. You know, if you want if you want power, you have to play these games. And Carol says, uh, do you think we've become more prone to anxiety and that that encourages us to encourages us to choose misleading leaders? Maybe it's our fault. Is it our fault? We have the leaders we have. Well, I'm, I, I've always been quite a fan of the argument that you get the leaders you deserve, mm. except that we don't always vote for the same person. So that's a bit of a bit of a half argument, really. So is it partly our fault? I think the answer is partly yes. I think there is something in us um, as a collective species which um, which feeds off the anxiety. We we want people. We, this is like Durkheim's argument. We want our leaders to be godlike in their ability to solve all our problems and to to anxiety what we don't want is someone to come along and say you know what i'm not sure about this i'm not sure whether we can get through this but i'll try my best and if you look at churchill for example some of his early statements in the in the second world war are not at all optimistic I mean, he says that hopefully we'll do this but it's going to cost us and it's going to take years and years as opposed to we'll do it by next week or the war will be over by christmas i mean how often have you heard that but that, that's not something which Churchill says. Uh, so Churchill says this is going to be a long, hard road and we might be successful. And if we're not, you know, that's just the way it goes. So I think there is something in us about our anxiety reduction mechanism, which leads us to vote for people that are optimistic, uh, positive and confident. And, and that may not be the right way to choose people. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. Absolutely uh, fascinating. So much um, packed in there. Um, and uh, what an amazing way of uh, rounding off uh, most of our day. So thank you very much to Keith Grint. Now, we would love to do um, a word cloud again. Um, the moment you come out of this, this will appear. Um, and it's going to say the same question as yesterday. And we're going to see whether it's different or not, uh, which is using up to three words. Please describe your thoughts on today's conference. So we just have one very short session left uh, which is my summing up at the end um, so I will see you all on the other side um, in a, a moment for that but um, thank you so much Keith that was absolutely fascinating and um, has given us a lot to think about and is so topical at the moment when obviously leaders um, particularly Trump are, are in our minds so thank you so much for that Keith thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Bye -bye. thanks bye-bye